Good morning. My name is Esan Yazdi, and I'm a cancer researcher at State University of New York. While pursuing my master's degree in genetics back in London, I was devastated by uh, the emotional distress of losing my mother to colon cancer at the age of 49. This is about seven years ago. Now, becoming a cancer researcher was definitely not my childhood dream. But losing my mother to cancer entirely changed my life goals. And that's why I'm here today talking to you. Cancer is the unrestricted uh, growth of a normal cell. And when this, this happens, it forms a, tu a primary tumor in the patient, which is, to some extent, uh, nowadays curable. But it gets very complicated when it uh, forms metastasis to other parts of the body. Now, the first documented case of uh, cancer uh, was about 500 BC, uh, where uh, Persian queen Atusa had her uh, slave remove her breast, which was malignant. Now, this primitive uh, approach, which now we call uh, uh, mastectomy, uh, is still the common uh, combat against uh, primary tumors. Now, if you have a primary tumor, this is what you do these days. But if you have a metastatic tumor, surgery is not going to be helpful anymore. So over the years and centuries, actually, um, there has been progress in developing other uh, um, uh, ways of combating uh, cancer. By the development of uh, discovery of X-ray by Mary Curie uh, in the 20th century, um, Radiotherapy was introduced, which actually uh, um, kills cancer cells or any other cell by uh, uh, use of, of high energy X ray. But unfortunately, when you use, uh, uh, use X ray in radiotherapy, you're killing cancer cells, but you're also killing normal cells. And this is the downside uh, uh, of this. Now, uh, Moreover, by doing so, you would also introduce new risks to cancer by mechanisms such as DNA damage that occurs by, by uh, um, radiotherapy. Now, other, later on, other methods uh, for, uh, um, uh, for tumor treatment was, uh, were introduced, such as chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Now, in fact, the first um, uh, chemotherapy agent that was introduced, uh, mustard gas, was used as a weapon to kill masses of people during World War I. So now you can imagine that if you have such a uh, uh, agent used as a drug for cancer, that obviously is killing cancer cells and also normal cells. And more importantly, what happens in this case of, of, of uh, chemotherapy is that you are uh, basically destroying the hematopoietic uh, system of the body, which is responsible for making uh, blood cells and immune cells. So if you look at all these different types of uh, um, uh, inventions and therapies for cancer over the years, they were uh, considered a victory against the fight, of, uh, fight against uh, the fight with cancer. But if you look at it now, you still see that after all this time, we're still struggling, and we have uh, cancer as a big challenge to our societies. So we basically are on a on a cycle of redefining victory as we progress. Now, if you take the last 50 years, uh, we have had great success with a lot of uh, um, our discoveries to treat dif uh, fight different uh, diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, which we have been very successful. But look what happens to cancer. Over the past 50 years, we've had virtually no success in reducing the death that is caused by cancer. Now, if you look at the expenses that we've had, uh, um, uh, for example, in this uh, slide, uh, in the year 2006, only in the United States, you see that breast cancer stays at the very top with about $14 billion spent in that year, uh, which is followed by colorectal cancer, lung cancer, and lymphoma, which are all about, each one of them, about 
$10 billion in the year 2006. Now, if you break down these expenses, uh, I would like to uh, uh, draw your attention to the brown portion of these bar graphs, which represents the expenses for the last year of the patient's life. And you would see that it, it accounts for about one-third of the total cost for the care of, of that you know, patient with any of these specific cancers. Now, what this tells us is that we have been virtually unsuccessful in increasing the quality of life of these patients, especially in the final year, considering the amount of, of, of money that is spent. So what is the solution? Where are we going uh, with, with cancer treatment? Well, if you take uh, um, any of the uh, uh, treat, uh, treatments that I described to you earlier, such as chemotherapy, uh, radiotherapy and, and the surgery, the inability of these, uh, of these uh, treatments to uh, um, cure cancer, basically, they do obviously treat cancer, but they don't cure cancer, um, is the fact that uh, has uh, led a lot of investigators throughout the world to come up with uh, a way to distinguish a cancer cell from a normal cell. And by doing so, you would uh, target the properties of a cancer cell that is specific to a cancer cell, and you would, you would kill a cancer cell without touching a normal cell. And this is called a targeted cancer therapy. Now, I would like to actually um, give it another name. That's pharmacosurgical strike. And what I mean by this is that in the case of primary uh, tumors, surgery is the best option. You remove uh, the site of the tumor, and you're basically curing the patient. If we are able to design anti-cancer drugs that are capable of doing that in the whole body, then we wish to eradicate the pro not only the primary tumor, but also the metastatic tumor throughout the body, and in a very selective manner without harming the normal cells. And we can also, by this way, Unlike chemotherapy, where you deliver a systemic uh, drug and you don't know where it goes, target and accumulate our drugs to the site of the tumor. Now, you would say, where do we start? Well, a, a fascinating project that is ongoing right now um, is the Cancer Genome Atlas, where it is aiming to identify and sequence the genome of every cancer there is. And by doing so, you would be able to distinguish the genome, the genes that are upregulated or downregulated or manipulated, mutated in a cancer, and compare that to a normal genome. And then you would have uh, basically uh, a lot of candidate targets that you can use and design a drug to, which would selectively kill cancer without harming the normal cells. Now, uh, there, there are numerous investigators throughout the world who are investigating this targeted cancer therapy currently, and we're one of many. Uh, we have uh, been able to um, uh, design an anti-cancer drug that is capable of selectively killing a whole variety of different types of tumors without affecting normal cells. Now, what I'm here showing you here is um, uh, uh, cells from human melanoma, ovarian cancer, and pancreatic cancer, and this is how the, the morphology of these cells look when you look at them uh, through a light microscope in, in the culture. When we treated these cells the, uh, with our anti-cancer peptide, we, were, we observed a dramatic destruction of these cells morphologically, and were able to kill all of the cells in the culture dish. Now, in contrast, when we tested normal cells, there was no difference in the, in the uh, morphology of these cells. And in fact, when we uh, biochemically analyze this, the cells are not dead. So basically, this is the property that we were looking for, to be able to selectively target a whole different range of uh, uh, cancers without affecting normal cells. Now, we have tested so far a whole series of different types of cancers, 
uh, from pancreatic breast, ovarian, melanoma, colon, brain, cervical cancer, lung cancer, and osteosarcomas, which are totally affected by the drug and are eradicated in culture dish in the laboratory uh, in vitro, the so-called in vitro conditions. And when we treated the uh, normal counterparts of these cells, uh, um, you would see that, you know, that they were not affected. Uh, and specifically, I would like to refer to stem cells that were untouched uh, uh, by the uh, drug, and they were not killed, and they were able to differentiate. And this is a, a clear uh, difference between our drug and uh, current chemotherapy, which, as I mentioned earlier, is capable, uh, is, is able to actually destroy the hematopoietic system of the body. But this is an advantage of, of what we have here. Now, what I showed you was all in vitro conditions in the laboratory. We have tested uh, multiple cancers uh, in, in, in mice, where we've created a, um, a pancreatic cancer uh, in these animals. And when you leave the animal with a pancreatic cancer, the tumor grows in this fashion in size over a certain period of time. But when, you add, when we added the drug uh, daily to these cells, to these animals, basically, uh, there was no growth of the tumor. And we also showed this in other uh, uh, um, models for ovarian cancer. So, and we're, in fact, the good news is that we're actually on our path to have the uh, first uh, phase one human trial uh, using this drug for pancreatic cancer. Now, all right, I know the heart is, is really uh, tempting, but this is a cancer cell. This is a human pancreatic cancer cell in the dish, and this is living. And what we did was that we uh, added uh, um, a, a dye that would uh, um, basically stain the energy-producing factory of the cell. That's the mitochondria. And by doing so, you see all these uh, um, particles, basically the warm shade green uh, things, are the mitochondria of this living cell. Now, I would play this uh, very short movie for you now, which would show you what happens to a cell? How does a cell look in the dish uh, when, uh, when it's living and it's happy? Of course, this is an aggressive and, and, a, and not a good cell. This is what's happening. The cell is moving around, it's happy. Then we add our drug to this cell. What happens? The cell shrinks, it rolls up, and it lifts, and it dies right away. And, and uh, this is very, very rapidly. It is, of course, sad, <laughs> but we're happy. So if you take that exact same cell and take it under the uh, scanning electron micro microscope, where you can look at the cells in the dish from the top, right? So you're basically seeing a, a, a human pancreatic cancer cell that has been treated with our drug, and this is how it looks. You see it has extensions. It's trying to grab itself to the dish. Um, and I'm about to show you what happens to this cell on the surface of, of, of the cell after being exposed to the drug. This is what happens. What do you see? Numerous pores that are made throughout the surface area of the cell, which gives it no time to survive, no time to, to repair, and it kills it very rapidly. Well, how does this how does it uh, look? Well, let's say the cancer cell is this balloon. And this pin is our smart drug. What happens? You are, by poking a hole into the uh, cell, into the balloon, you are able to kill the cell right away. You're not activating any biochemical pathways. You're not getting into uh, deep into the cell or anything. Now, this has to obviously be smart enough to be selective. So actually, we have looked at other uh, types of uh, um, uh, cancers, such as melanoma. And you see here, again, this is an untreated cell, the cell surface. It's very smooth. This is magnified here, very intact. But the moment we expose it to our drug, you see all these pores formed throughout the, the membrane of the cell, like a magic bullet. 
That's what it does. But why is it magic? Because this does not occur in a normal condition, in a normal cell. This is a fibroblast that I showed you earlier that had no effect, uh, that our drug had no effect on it. Um, you see this cell has been treated. This is, the, uh, this is the surface area. And you see there are deposits, but there's no pore formation in these cells. And so there's no cell death. So it is uh, a very smart uh, um, little peptide that is capable of, of killing cancer cells selectively. Now, what is the advantage of this over what is available outside is its built-in delivery mechanism, that it's capable when, it give it, when you give it systemically to, to a cancer patient, it's able to accumulate at the tumor site, unlike chemotherapy. It is targeted. Once it gets to where it gets, it is able to uh, um, induce these uh, selective pore formation on the cell surface of, of cancer cells and not normal cells. In 2012, there's going to be 1.5 million new cases of cancer. 600,000 people are going to die this year in the United States alone. As we're sitting in this auditorium right now, today, 1,500 people are going to die in this country because of cancer. What can you do about it? Well, like any other disease, there's always prevention. For example, you can stay aware from known carcinogens, such as uh, uh, cigarette smoke that develops uh, lung cancer. Or you can uh, have a healthy diet, which it has been extensively shown in, in recent years that, that it inhibits uh, um, cancer. I would also recommend to get screened. The Cancer Genome Project that I just uh, uh, described to you earlier uh, is enabling us to find the key genes that are mutated in a, in a, a, that give rise to a specific form of cancer. You can get screened now and look to see if, whether or not you're positive for any of those markers. And this would, uh, you know, give you a precaution as to what you should, uh, what options you have. And last but not least, I cannot emphasize on this enough. Please get tested, get tested, and get tested. Now, virtually everybody in the field of cancer today believes that if you detect cancer early, and if you treat it early, virtually most of the cancers are curable, for example, colon cancer. But it is only uh, gets very complicated when, when it metastasizes to other locations in the body that virtually nobody can do anything. So these are the things that you can do. How can cancer research contribute to this? Well, by the story that I, uh, and stories of, of uh, similar approaches that I just told you today, targeted cancer therapy where it reduces the side effects of, of chemotherapy and, and, and radiation therapy, radiotherapy, um, and also uh, um, kills cancer cells selectively without harming your normal tissue. So please, again, get tested. Thank you.